Good evening and welcome to Gresham College and a particular welcome to anybody who is here for the very first time. Um, we hope it will, will be the first of many such visits in that case. For many pure mathematicians, proof is the heart of their subject. It's what gives mathematics its power. When we prove a mathematical fact, we're establishing the necessary truth of something which is independent of the constraints of the human mind, which transcends our physical existence. Beethoven's symphonies or Michelangelo's paintings are meaningful only in the context of human existence. They depend on the very human senses we have. Newton and Einstein's equations model the physical laws which happen to hold in the universe we happen to live in. But mathematical truths are true in every possible universe. Even if there were no intelligent life anywhere, 19 would still be a prime number. Or so, I think, many mathematicians believe, perhaps slightly naively. But here's John Dee writing in 1570. A marvellous neutrality have these things mathematical. In mathematical reasonings, a probable argument is nothing regarded, nor yet the testimony of sense any whit credited, but only a perfect demonstration of truths certain, necessary, and invincible, universally and necessarily concluded, is allowed as sufficient for an argument exactly and purely mathematical. So this talk is going to explore mathematical proof and the use of computers in mathematics. We're going to begin by looking at a few examples of different kinds of proofs. These will be short, and although I hope to convey at least some of the spirit of the mathematics, it doesn't matter too much if you don't follow the details. We'll then look at two famous cases where computers have been used to prove long-standing mathematical conjectures, the four-color theorem and the Kepler conjecture. We will end with some reflections on the present-day state of computer proof and on the future. I'm drawing in particular on two recent accounts from leading mathematicians. Sir Timothy Gower's London Mathematical Society popular lecture last year, and especially a very good survey account by Thomas Hales, which appeared while I was preparing this lecture, and without which tonight's talk would have been very different. So what is proof? And why is it so highly valued by mathematicians? Well, a proof is an argument which demonstrates that a proposition must be true. So here's a problem. How many dots are in this hexagon? And how many dots would there be if there were n dots on each side rather than seven? We could count them, but there's an ingenious argument which shows us the answer through insight. We can regard this image not as a flat two-dimensional hexagon, but as a three-dimensional cube in which we are seeing the top, the front, and the left-hand sides only, and hidden is the main portion of the cube. So what we see is three sides of a seven by seven by seven cube, and we don't see the six by six by six cube behind them. So the number of dots is n cubed minus n minus one cubed. Is this a proof? I can never quite decide whether I'm satisfied with this as a proof or not. It's a wonderful insight, but is it rigorous? So perhaps for a more traditional proof, here's a simple problem famously solved by the great mathematician Gauss when he was a schoolboy. What is the sum of all the integers between one and n? I'm claiming it's a half times n times n plus one, and I'm going to prove it. I start off by writing out the sum, one plus two plus three up to n, but I can also write the sum in reverse, n plus n minus one plus n minus two, and so on. Now, if we look at the terms corresponding in this layout, if we add one to n, we get n plus one. If we add two to n minus one, we get n minus one. Similarly, three plus n minus two, and so on, up to n plus one, all give us n plus one. So if we add together 
the two lines I have here. On the left-hand side, we have twice our sum, and on the right-hand side, we have n plus 1, repeated n times. So that tells us that 2s is n times n plus 1, or s is a half n n plus 1, and that's the result I claimed. So this is a direct proof, and it's conclusive. If someone follows the argument, they have to accept that the result is true. I'm going now to prove the same result in another way, by what I regard as the very wonderful method of mathematical induction. Sadly, my students um, are often less enthusiastic about induction proofs, and perhaps we'll see why in a moment. A proof by induction has two parts. First, the basis. Um, to, 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 one shows the property holds um, for perhaps the special case n equals 1. Um, the basis where one sh shows for a certain starting value the result is true, usually n equals 1. And then the inductive step where you show that if the result holds for n equals k, then it also holds for n equals k plus 1. So what that means in the case of our series, we're going to argue that the sum of the integers 1 through n is a half times n times n plus 1. In the case n equals 1, on the left-hand side, we have 1, the sum of 1, nothing else. On the right-hand side, we have a half of 1 times 2, which comes out as 1. So that is correct for the case n equals 1. Now, suppose the result is true when n is some integer k. So we have that the sum of the integers up to k is a half times k times k plus 1. What happens when n becomes k plus 1? Well, we want the sum of 1 plus 2 up to k plus 1, which means adding k plus 1 to the left-hand side there. So we get a half k, k plus 1, plus another k plus 1. And with a little algebra, that turns into a half k plus 1, k plus 2, which is the um, formula when n is replaced by k plus 1. So we've established the inductive step, and I claim we've now established our result for all positive integers n. It's true for n equals 1, that was the basis. By the inductive step, since it was true for n equals 1, it's also true for n equals 2. Applying the inductive step again, since it's true for n equals 2, we can deduce it is also true for n equals 3, and so on. So for any integer r that you give me, I can show the result holds by applying the inductive step repeatedly, starting from n equals 1, and after a finite number of steps, we've established the result for the case n equals r. So proof by induction allows us to prove something for all positive integers through only these two steps. Basically, the inductive hypothesis allows us to deal with infinitely many cases in a single, at the same time. So induction is one nice form of proof, but there are others. Um, another which my students don't always like is proof by contradiction or reductio ad absurdum. The idea here is that a true mathematical statement cannot lead to a contradiction. So we see what happens if the result we want to prove is not true. If we can deduce that its non-truth leads to a contradiction, then we have shown that the result cannot not be true, that is, it must be true. So a classic example is Euclid's famous proof that there are infinitely many prime numbers. You may remember that a prime number is an integer greater than one, which is divisible only by itself and one. We're going to show that if the proposition is not true, that is, if there are only finitely many primes, then we have a contradiction. For if there are only finitely many primes, we can list them. They will start 2, 3, 5, 7, etc., and go up to P, which is the biggest of these finitely many primes. We can now calculate the product of all these primes, 2 times 3 times 5 times P, and add 1 to it. This gives us a big number. This number is one more than a multiple of two. So if you divide by two, it leaves a remainder of one. Similarly, if you divide by three, since three divides the first part of the expression, it also leaves a remainder of one. 
And similarly, for any prime number in our list, when it divides Q, it gives us a remainder of one. So either Q is a prime, so Q is not divisible by any prime number in our list. So either it's a prime number itself, or it's divisible by primes not in our list. But in either case, it, it requires that there be prime numbers which are not in our list of all the prime numbers. So our list was incomplete, and we have a contradiction, and the only way to resolve that contradiction it is, to, is to note that we couldn't, in fact, list all the prime numbers to begin with. So we've shown there must be infinitely many prime numbers. The tradition of proof goes back to perhaps the most famous book in the history of mathematics, Euclid's Elements, written around 300 BCE. We know almost nothing about Euclid. We don't know how much of the elements is his own original work and how much is his, his presentation of earlier mathematics. But the method of the elements has defined the way pure mathematics has been practiced for the last 2,300 years. In short, Euclid states a number of definitions and common notions. For example, that things which equal the same thing also equal one another. And then five postulates or axioms, which are self-evident statements that the reader will agree to be true. He then rigorously proves results about geometry using only these axioms and propositions which have already been proved from these axioms. That way, the whole mathematical edifice is built on solid foundations. Every result must be true because it follows from the self-evident axioms and from things we have already established with absolute certainty. So here is Euclid's proposition one, which asserts that given a straight line, it is possible to construct an equilateral triangle on it. We'll prove this using only Euclid's first four axioms. Um, I'm not going to say anything about the fifth axiom, because that's a very different story, and um, you may well have heard Professor Flood give an excellent lecture about that story earlier this year. So the first four axioms are postulate one, it is possible to draw a straight line from any point to any point. Postulate two, you can extend a straight line continuously in a straight line. You can draw a circle with any centre and any radius, and all right angles equal one another. I hope you will grant that these are plausible, if not self-evident, statements, and that these are sufficiently solid that we can build our geometry on them. So to prove proposition one, we start with our given line AB. Using axiom three, we can draw a circle with centre A and radius AB. Using the same axiom again, we can draw another circle with radius B and centre AB. These circles meet at C, and by axiom one, we can draw a line joining A to C because we can draw a line joining any two points. We can also draw the straight line BC, again by postulate one. So we have this configuration, and because AB and AC are, um, sorry, AB and AC are both radii of the same circle, they are the same length. Similarly, BC and AB are radii of the other circle, so they are the same length. And by the common notion that things which equal one another, equal, things which equal the same thing equal one another, we see that all three sides of the triangle are equal. So we've created the required equilateral triangle on AB. So a proof is a rigorous demonstration of the truth of a proposition. It is checkable. Each proof in Euclid's elements can be checked by you or me. The truth of the propositions is certain, and each of us can verify this for ourselves. One of the reasons proof is the gold standard in mathematics is this checkability. Any of us can, in principle, satisfy ourselves that a published proof is correct, although in the case of Andrew Wallace's proof of Fermat's last theorem, that might take a little time for most of us. However, it is possible to err in constructing a proof. 
Um, I'm going to show you a geometric proof of a statement that you might find slightly surprising because it's obviously not true, but what I'm going to prove is that there's no point inside a circle. This proof comes from a rather nice little book of 1959 by E.A. Maxwell called Fallacies in Mathematics. So I'm going to prove this by contradiction. I'm going to take a circle with centre O and radius small r and let P be any point inside the circle. So P is definitely inside the circle. You can see it's you know, in, in the circle. Um, we're going to prove that P is not in the circle, but actually lies on the circumference. In the diagram, I'm going to take the point Q, such that OP times OQ is equal to R squared. So Q will be outside the circle because OP is less than R. Um, R is the midpoint of PQ, and the perpendicular bisector of PQ cuts the circle at U and V. So that's the setup. And what we're now going to look at is that OP is OR minus RP. I think that's clear. And OQ is OR plus RQ. And RQ and RP are the same. So that's OR plus RP. So when we multiply these two, OP times OQ is um, the difference between two squares, OR squared minus RP squared. We can now use Pythagoras. OR is the one side of right angle triangle, ORU. So OR squared is OU squared minus RU squared. And similarly, PR is one side of right angle triangle, PRU. So RP squared is PU squared minus RU squared. So OP times OQ is OR squared minus RP squared. And Substituting these, we get OU squared minus PU squared. But OP times OQ was, the, was R squared, and OU squared is also R squared. So we've shown that OP squared, OU squared is OU squared minus PU squared, and so PU has to be zero, which means that P must be in the circumference of the circle. So we've chosen the point that wasn't in the circumference and shown it must be in the circumference, and that proves any point inside the circle isn't inside the circle. Okay. So the fallacy in this proof is left for the audience to identify, um, but in fact this is quite an interesting proof because it does prove a genuinely interesting mathematical result, just not the one I'm claiming. So. But perhaps having seen this proof, you prefer proofs that don't use diagrams. So here are two induction proofs which also prove incorrect results. The first from Maxwell's book, we're going to prove any two numbers are equal. We're going to use induction on the maximum of the numbers. So if you have two integers of which the maximum is one, well, the only positive integers available are one, so they must both be one. So for the case, that the maximum is one, they are the same. Suppose now for the inductive step um, that we, um, if it's true that any two integers of which larger is k, is k must be equal, then we can extend that to k plus one. So suppose we have integers m and n where the larger is k plus one. Then m minus one and n minus one are two numbers of which larger is k. By the inductive hypothesis, they must be equal, and since m minus 1 equals m, n minus 1, then m equals n. So we've shown that any two numbers must be equal. Okay, um, here's another induction proof. This one is due to Paul Halmos. Um, we're going to prove that if you have a set of n horses, that all these horses are the same colour. Okay. Again, induction on n, we're going to use induction on the number of horses in the set. If n equals 1, then we have a set containing only one horse, so it's certainly true that all the horses in that set are the same colour. For the inductive step, suppose we have a set, or suppose the result is true for sets containing k horses. 
If we're given a set of k plus 1 horses, we can take the subset containing horses 1 up to k. That's a set of k horses. So by the inductive hypothesis, these horses are all the same colour. If we then take the set of horses 2 and 3 up to k plus 1, that's another set of k horses, which are all the same colour by the inductive hypothesis. And so um, if you look at horse k plus 1, it's the same colour as horse k from the second set, and then all the other horses are the same colour. So we've proved the result that all horses in a set of k are the same, same colour. Now, none of these last three proofs is actually valid. Um, and it is instructive to find the deliberate errors in these proofs. But if they've made you pause for a moment, which they did me when I first saw them, uh, they've shown it's possible to be misled by an apparent mathematical proof. These examples are frivolous, but there are plenty of cases of very good mathematicians proving erroneous proofs. The great Richard Feynman once said, I have mathematically proven to myself so many things that aren't true. The most notorious example is Fermat's claimed, but presumably incorrect, proof of his last theorem. If he did have a false proof of Fermat's last theorem, he wasn't alone. More than a thousand false proofs of Fermat's last theorem were produced between 1908 and 1912 alone. You may feel this has taken us a long way from the perfection of Euclid's rigour. But in fact, there's a gap in the proof of Euclid's Proposition 1, which I demonstrated earlier. The proof assumed that the two circles, each of which passes through the centre of the other, must intersect. Is that obvious? Is it, I mean, it, it, does it follow from any of Euclid's axioms? No, it doesn't. It requires something like the intermediate value theorem from the 19th century, and this proof was eventually corrected only by David Hilbert in 1899, 2,200 years after Euclid. So human mathematicians are imperfect. We can be led astray. We can make errors when creating or when checking proofs. Computers carry out algorithms more accurately than people do. So perhaps computers can create and check proofs. The first major public demonstration of a computer contribution to mathematical proof came when Kenneth Apple and Wolfgang Hacken proved the four colour theorem in 1976. This story has been rather well told by Professor Robin Wilson, both in a Gresham College lecture, which you can watch online, and in his book, Four Colours Suffice. Um, this is the cover of the first edition in which the publisher seems to have gone to some trouble to obscure the writer's name, probably for good marketing reasons. Uh, there is a new edition coming out. Um, this is, I believe, is a draft cover. I'd be rather careful about it because they don't even seem to have spelt the title right. <laughs> but, um, but either of these, the lecture or the book, is an excellent account of the history of the four colour theorem. And this story is particularly instructive in the context of tonight's lecture. The question, the four colour theorem, is whether any map on the plane can be coloured with no more than four colours so that no two regions sharing a common boundary are given the same colour. Regions which meet only at a point can share colour, but not adjacent ones. Augustus de Morgan posed the question in 1852, and eventually, in 1879, Alfred Bray Kemp proved that four colours are enough. Kemp's proof was ingenious and introduced powerful new ideas. It isn't particularly difficult to follow, and if I had a bit longer, I would have liked to have shown it to you. Um, it's a very nice proof, but unfortunately, it was irretrievably flawed, although nobody noticed for about 10 years, until Percy Haywood uh, pointed out the error in 1889 by finding an example in which Kemp's method didn't work. It wasn't a counterexample to the theorem. It simply refuted Kemp's method. I have to say that the error in Kemp's proof seems to me to be very subtle. 
when I was preparing to present this topic to my students, even although I knew about the error, even although I had Haywood's counterexample in front of me, I still found the proof totally convincing. So, so by the end of the 19th century, the four-colour conjecture is open again, and despite attacks by a number of notable mathematicians, when I was a schoolboy, it was still one of the most famous unsolved problems of mathematics. So Apple and Hacken's proof was exciting, but it was also controversial. They followed Kemp's approach, which was in two parts. First, one finds an unavoidable set of configurations, um, configurations one of which must be possible in any, sorry, one of which must be present in any map. Then one shows that every one of this set is reducible, which means that if it is present in a map, then that map can be coloured with only four colours. And if you can find such a set and show that every member of it is reducible, then we've proved the four-colour theorem. But whereas Kemp's unavoidable set contained only two configurations and could easily be checked by hand, Apple and Hatton's set contained almost 2,000 configurations, and the reducibility of each one was checked by a computer program, not by hand. This involved over 1,000 hours of computer time, and full checking by a human being was, and remains, impossible. So the reaction from some mathematicians to the proof by Apple and Hacken was not excitement at the solution to a long-standing problem, but rather horror. They said things like, in my view, such a solution does not belong to the mathematical sciences at all, or God wouldn't let the theorem be proved by a method as terrible as that. <laughs> but mathematicians who hoped that the computer proof would be followed by a human one, an unaided human one, have been disappointed. There is still no proof of the four-colour theorem that does not rely on computer calculations. While we can check the programs and check the hardware design of the computers running them, we cannot check the proof itself entirely by hand. It should be noted that the reaction was not uniformly hostile to the proof. When Hacken's son presented his father's proof at a seminar in Berkeley, reports suggest that the audience was divided pretty well by age. Those over 40 were not prepared to accept a proof by computer. Those under 40 felt that a computer proof was actually preferable to a long 700-page human proof, which they felt was much less likely to be correct. And so your attitude to computer proof may depend on your age. The four-colour theorem is not the only long outstanding mathematical conjecture to have yielded to the computer. An even older problem is the Kepler conjecture, dating back to the beginning of the 17th century. The great scientist, Johannes Kepler, had been discussing how to stack spherical objects in correspondence with English mathematician Thomas Harriot. Kepler's on the left, the image in the middle is possibly Harriot, although it's by no means certain that that is Harriet. Their interest was in packing cannonballs on board ship. Kepler's conjecture is that the most efficient way to stack spheres is the way you find um, oranges set out in, in your local greengrocer. The bottom layer is set out in a square lattice, and the next layer is inserted into the gaps in a natural way. This layout, which for the next few minutes I'll call the, the greengrocer's arrangement, seems to be the most efficient packing in terms of maximising the density of oranges and minimising the wasted space between them. But is it the best? Another contender is hexagonal packing, but if you have better three-dimensional visualisation powers than I do, you can see that this is simply the same arrangement viewed from a different angle. The animation may help with that. Well, Kepler asked the question, Newton worked on the problem, and in 1831, Gauss showed that the Greengrocer's arrangement is best if you require 
that the packing form a regular lattice. But perhaps an irregular pack packing might be denser. In 1900, David Hilbert included this problem in his list of 23 unsolved mathematical problems that set the agenda for 20th century mathematicians. The next breakthrough came in 1953, when Laszlo Toth showed that the problem could be reduced to a finite, albeit enormous, set of calculations. And at the beginning of the 1990s, Thomas Hales showed that the problem could be solved by minimizing a certain function of 150 variables. He then addressed this problem using specialized mathematical software for solving minimization problems. The method is called linear programming, and it's quite um, involved. By examining 5,000 different configurations of spheres, which meant solving 100,000 100, different linear programming problems, Hales claims that through using the software to solve these problems, he's proved the conjecture that the Greengrosser's method is best. Hales's initial proof ran to 250 pages, along with, and this is the difficult bit, three gigabytes of computer data. After several years' work, referees said they were 99% satisfied of its correctness. Parts of the proof were published in a leading refereed mathematical journal, but in the end, the journal, understandably, couldn't find referees prepared to sacrifice the time necessary to check the work fully. Where Hale's proof of the Kepler conjecture differs from the computer proof of the four color theorem is, I think, in the nature of the computer software used. While Apple and Hacken use bespoke software, which could to some extent be checked, Hales is relying on standard linear programming software, which is of another order of complexity. While most mathematicians believe Hales's proof is correct, it's a long way from a traditional mathematical proof that you or I could check for ourselves. So these two examples of the four-color theorem and the Kepler conjecture are cases where computers have assisted mathematicians in finding and verifying proofs. But a fascinating area of contemporary computer science is the use of computers to construct complete proofs and to find new results. And there have been some remarkable triumphs although no, com no computer has yet found a new theorem sensational enough to hit the headlines in the popular press. But results have been found, and there are websites where you can buy the naming rights to a new computer-discovered mathematical theorem. But one of the most important results of 20th century mathematics is the fight thompson theorem. The terms in the definition are technical, um, but the nature of the achievement should be clear even if the terms aren't. In 1911, the British mathematician William Burnside asked whether every group of odd order is soluble. This is a reasonably simple sounding statement, and the result was finally proved by Walter Feit and John Thompson over 50 years later, in 1962. Their paper was 255 pages long, it was unprecedented in the subject at the time. And another 50 years later, late in 2012, a team led by Georges Gontier has formalized this proof in an interactive theorem proving computer system called Cork. And we now have a computer proof of the, of the Fike Thompson theorem. Just, just to give a flavor for anybody who has, remembers a little group theory, this is the computer representation of the structure of a finite group. And if you remember the axioms of a group, the um, closure, identity, um, closure, associative, identity, and inverse, these may remind you of that. And here's a statement of the result that the computer proved. Thomas Hales has written of this that, to me as a mathematician, nothing else that has been done by the formal proof community compares in splendor to the formalization of this theorem. So that's one big computer 
contribution to mathematics. Computers have contributed a great deal more to mathematics. In 1989, 2,000 hours of the time of a Cray supercomputer showed that there is no finite projective plane of order 10. The case of order 12 remains completely out of reach, however. Computers have also helped prove results such as the Catalan conjecture, which states that the only non-trivial integer solution of x to the power n minus y to the power m equals 1 is 3 squared minus 2 cubed equals, it, equals 1, 9 minus 8 equals 1. Mihalescu's proof of this result in 2002 used one minute of computer time, although a subsequent proof has been found which doesn't use computers at all. Computers have also found counterexamples to conjectures, so Euler's conjecture that in integers an nth power cannot be the sum of n minus one other nth powers was refuted by the computational discovery that the fifth fifth powers of 27, 84, 110, and 133 add up to 144 to the power of 5. And more recently, a counterexample involving three fourth powers summing to a fourth has also been found, although the numbers there are much bigger. Computers help mathematicians in many other ways. One obvious one is visualisation. Computer images and animations have been enormously helpful in areas of mathematics such as chaos theory and nonlinear dynamical systems and in many other fields of pure mathematics. For example, Gwyneth Stallard works with Julia sets in complex analysis, such as the one on the left, and Caroline Series has studied the masket embedding in group theory, which gives rise to the picture on the right. Mathematicians have also used computers to test conjectures and to examine examples which suggest ideas for theorems which can be investigated and sometimes proved by hand. The Birch and Swinnert and Dyer conjecture, one of the major outstanding mathematical problems of, of today and one for which you stand to win a million dollars from the Clay Institute, if you can prove it, was inspired by observation of computer calculations. And Sato was similarly inspired in proposing the Sato Tate conjecture about elliptic curves, which is still, I believe, unsolved. But it's not just through calculation that computers help mathematicians. A couple of years ago, one of our leading mathematicians, the Fields Medalist Sir Timothy Gowers, who gave a very nice talk at Gresham College a couple of years ago, told the British Mathematical Colloquium that one of the most useful tools for a working mathematician today is Wikipedia. While many academics are critical of, or even hostile to Wikipedia, its mathematics, con its mathematics content seems to be genuinely very reliable, accurate, and useful. If you want to get into a new area of mathematics, Wikipedia is certainly the place to start, and not only because of its convenience. Online journals, the availability of journal articles online, and the archive where mathematicians post preprints of their papers also play a huge role in helping mathematicians communicate. Such ready access to these information sources brings considerable benefits to mathematicians. And in general, the communications revolution has had a profound effect on the practice of mathematics. While mathematicians have always worked together, the pace of electronic communication has made possible new forms of collaboration. One example is Gower's polymaths. In January 2009, Gower's posted a major unsolved mathematical problem on his blog and invited collaboration from anyone who wished to join in. Over 40 people took part and the problem was solved in seven weeks. The pace of development was remarkable. Gower suggests that perhaps, whereas in the past, fear of being anticipated led mathematicians to work privately, the public forum of the Polymath blog encourages the immediate sharing of ideas because priority is established by the blog posting. 
and therefore makes large-scale collaborative work much more feasible. If Gowers is right, and research funding mechanisms which don't value massively collaborative work may push in the opposite direction, but if Gowers is right, computer communications are profoundly changing the way mathematics is being done. So where is proof in mathematics? In one major respect, the nature of proof has changed over time. In its time, the 255-page proof of the Frank Thompson theorem was a monster, but it's now by no means unique. Many very important mathematical results have proofs which are accessible to very few, and to these only with great effort. Indeed, there are two mathematical statements whose shortest proof can be as long as you like. One example, given by Gödel, is a statement that this statement has no proof in piano arithmetic that contains fewer than 10 to the power of 1,000 symbols. So any valid proof of that proposition in a particular logical system would involve more than 10 to the power of 1,000 symbols, and that statement is true. So there can be very, very long mathematical proofs. The idea of the mathematical proof is something which anyone can check for themselves, no longer matches the reality of much present-day mathematics. So what happens when somebody proposes a new proof? Well, generally, the proof is peer-reviewed. But in 2004, the maverick mathematician Louis de Bronge announced the proof of the Riemann hypothesis, perhaps the greatest problem in mathematics still unsolved after a century and a half. His proposed proof was 124 pages long, and I understand it is far from clear. The approach he took was not thought by the mathematical community to be likely to lead to a proof of the Riemann hypothesis. De Bronge's proof does not appear to have been checked carefully by any of the relatively few mathematicians who are competent to evaluate it. Why should he spend time examining a proof they expect to be faulty when they could spend the time doing their own work on which their reputations and funding depend? So why would one take seriously De Bronge's proof? Well, he does have form, in fact. In 1984, De Bronge announced the proof of the Bieberbach conjecture in complex analysis. This was a conjecture which had been unproved for almost 70 years. His proof seems catchy and incomplete, and it was not initially accepted by his peers. But a group of mathematicians in Leningrad spent several months working on it and established it was in fact valid. So it's now called the Bieberbach conjecture is now De Bronge's theorem. But even with this track record, de Bronge's proof of the Riemann hypothesis remains in limbo. Lacking referees, it's not accepted, but it hasn't been refuted either. So it's hard to evaluate some of today's proofs. The story of the four-colour theorem shows that errors in proofs can be undetected for some time. It was more than 10 years before the problem with Kemp's proof was spotted. Other proofs have contained errors, some fixable and some not. There's even a Wikipedia page, sorry, there's even a Wikipedia page which lists important proofs which turned out, to, turned out to be erroneous or incomplete. When I last looked, it gave 37 examples, of which 15 were correct results, which have now been rigorously proved, we think. 10 were results which were incorrect as stated, but where a modified version has now been proved. Seven proofs were wrong and unfixable, and the status of five is unclear. The mathematicians involved included such great names as Cauchy, Riemann, Lebeig, and Gödel. So there's plenty of evidence that human proofs are fallible. And with Gödel's theorems having shown us that in any useful logical system, there are, comment, there are true statements which we cannot prove, and indeed that, roughly speaking, we cannot even prove that mathematics is consistent. It's perhaps surprising that we still do maths in much the same way. It's said that the great mathematician John von Neumann 
came out of a seminar by Godel in 1930 saying it's all over, implying that Godel's results were fatal to pure mathematics. Yet we still prove things. So where are we? I used to think it was ironic that we now consider as deluded these mathematicians of the 1880s who believed in the four color theorem on the basis of a simple proof that anyone could verify for themselves, thought they wrong though it turned out to be, whereas we're now confident in our superior knowledge of the veracity of the theorem on the basis of computer calculation that none of us could possibly check for ourselves in our lifetimes. But humans are fallible, so perhaps computer proofs are more reliable. But we still have to be careful. Here is a theorem which some computer proof assistants can prove. It says, or it seems to say, that there exists an integer n which has the property that n is strictly less than zero and also that n is strictly greater than zero. This statement is false. So how do the computer proof assistants prove it? Well, actually, they don't. They prove something else. What they're actually proving is the true statement that for any t, there exists an n such that t is less than n. That statement's provable, and they can prove it. But if you replace the name t, which is an arbitrary name, by the random string n less than 0 and 0, whatever, um, then that's a perfectly valid name in these systems for a variable. And if you put that in the formula, we get this true statement that you may misinterpret if you don't read it carefully enough. Um, OK, so computer proofs don't remove the possibility of ambiguity, although that is a rather frivolous example. But there's a bigger problem. In my last lecture, I talked about computer errors, and in particular mistakes by the human programmers and by the designers of computer systems. But there's another source of computer errors called soft errors. These are errors caused, for example, by cosmic rays, which can cause an alpha particle to be emitted, which, if you're unlucky, can change a value stored within a computer's memory. It doesn't happen very often, but estimates suggest with a powerful computer running for 77 hours, which was the time taken for a recent calculation in loop theory, you'd expect about 40 such errors during that time. That's at sea level. If you're at high altitude, you expect a lot more. So this raises the question of how sure we can be of a computer proof when the data may have been corrupted in the middle of the proof. So experience has taught us that human mathematicians are fallible, and even correctly designed and correctly programmed computers are liable to soft errors. Where does this leave mathematical proof? Thomas Hales, in his recent survey article on which I've drawn heavily in his lecture, says he admits physical limits to the reliability of any verification process, whether by hand or machine. These limits taint even the simplest theorems, such as our ability to verify that 1 plus 1 equals 2 is a consequence of a set of axioms. One rogue alpha particle brings all my schemes of perfection to naught. The fallibility of the human mind and the physics of our universe both affect the viability of absolute mathematical proof. So what does this mean for the practicing mathematician? In a popular lecture last year, Sir Timothy Gowers predicted that in 25 years' time, computers will be useful assistants to pure mathematicians, and that in 50 years' time, they will be doing mathematics better than humans. Should this come to pass, would pure mathematics still hold any interest for human beings? This survey has looked at some anecdotes in the recent history of proof, both by human and by machine. While I was writing the talk, I was very much aware that female mathematicians don't feature in any of my historical examples. Perhaps, since I've been looking mainly at incomplete and faulty proofs, that just shows that women don't make mistakes. 
But for over 2,300 years, ever since Euclid, proof has been central to mathematics, even if proofs have gone from being simple demonstrations, checkable, checkable by anybody, to long technical expositions, understandable only by a tiny number of specialists. With computers now proving theorems, mathematicians' relationship with proof may be about to change again. Is mathematics still going to be about these truths certain, necessary, and invincible, universally, and necessarily concluded? Well, thank you very much, and I'll be very happy to take questions. <laughs>